Our text for consideration this morning is the gospel which was written in Mark chapter 13. Knock, knock, knock. Ding dong. Phone vibrates. There's a person at the door. <laughs> rough, rough, rough. There are many signs that the guests have arrived. The children yell, they're here, they're here. Is the family ready? Are they ready for their guests to arrive? Well, let's go back in this scene to just about an hour ago and all that the family did to make sure that they were ready. Dad vacuumed the floors while Mom cooked the meal. The younger kids picked up their toys while the older kids made their beds. The family wanted to make sure that they were ready for their guests to arrive. They even put on some special music in the background. They lit the candles. Their house was ready. And fast forward back to the beginning of the scene. The oldest child opens the door as mom is walking forward and says, come on in. We're so happy to see you. I think we've all been in that situation before, getting ready for a guest to arrive. We want to have everything in place. We want to be ready. In the gospel today, there is a call to be ready, for Jesus is coming soon. Jesus will come on the last day to judge the living and the dead. He will take the righteous to eternal life, and the unrighteous will be sent to eternal destruction. Today, is a, there is a call to be ready, for Jesus is at the door. Jesus' discussion today comes in the context of him teaching some of his disciples. So he had a special conversation with four of the inner group of his disciples, Peter, James, John, and Andrew. And this is actually after they were leaving the temple. So a couple of weeks ago, we saw Jesus commend the poverty-stricken widow for her very generous offering, although it was very little in regards to money. And after that, Jesus left the temple for the last time. And as they were leaving the temple, one of the disciples remarks at the beauty of the building. And Jesus takes this as an opportunity to tell them what would come in the near future. He foretells the destruction of the temple. Jesus told them what would come in 70 AD when future Emperor Titus would lead a troop of soldiers to destroy the temple and all of Jerusalem. Now upon hearing this, on the Mount of Olives, one of Jesus' disciples in the inner crew had a question. Well, they had two questions. When will this happen, and what are the signs? Earlier in Mark 13, Jesus gives the signs to his disciples. In our section today, he tells them when it will happen. By not really telling them when it will happen, he just tells them soon. He's talking about the destruction of the temple, but he's connecting this to the end of the world, the day when the Son of Man comes in glory, when Jesus comes to judge the living and the dead, the final day. The disciples are given this encouragement that we are told to heed as well. 
be ready, for Jesus is at the door. What will that day be like when our Lord Jesus returns? There are many false teachings out there regarding the last day with which we need to watch out for. False stories about a secret coming of Jesus that not everyone will know. Some will be taken and some will be left. That's not how our Lord speaks about it here, though. Jesus talks about the Son of Man coming with power and glory. He sends his angels to collect the elect from all over the world. This will be a moment that everyone knows that the Son of Man has come again. A spectacle. The glory of God, the power of God on display. Everyone will know that Jesus has come. Now, in regard to the time, again, Jesus didn't tell them exactly when it would come. He tells them that no one knows. That this would be a time that there is uncertainty in regard to the human perspective. But all they can know is that soon, and very soon, the Son of Man will return. Now, we live 2,000 years after Jesus had said this to his disciples, so we recognize that God's perspective is different than our perspective, but the encouragement to be ready because Jesus is coming soon is even more amplified for us. Prior to the reading for today, Jesus had given signs to his disciples of his second coming, things to watch out for. Wars and rumors of wars. Signs in the sky. Signs in nature, such as famines and hurricanes and all sorts of natural disasters. That the love of most people would grow cold and that the gospel would be proclaimed throughout all the world. As we examine these signs, we see that they've all been fulfilled. That indicates to us that Jesus is at the door. We don't know when he will come. Jesus could come today. He could come tomorrow, or he could wait another 2,000 years. And since we don't know, that just heightens the call for us to be ready. Now, what does that mean to be ready for when Jesus returns? In this section, Jesus indicates two aspects of that readiness. First, that God is the one who makes you ready. And then a call to live in that readiness. Jesus tells his disciples that he will send his angels to collect the elect from all the world. Now, who are the elect? Who are the chosen of God? Brothers and sisters, you can apply that title to yourself. This is as it was said to the Ephesian Christians, Paul wrote, He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world so that we would be holy and blameless in his sight. Before the creation of the world, God chose you so that you would be ready at the end of the world. This is the doctrine of election, a teaching of comfort for God's people. Yes, we know that it is God who makes people ready for that day when Jesus will return. He chose you in eternity, and then in time he sent means, various means to bring you to him. We call these the means of grace, the gospel in word and sacrament. Some have called them the spoken word and the visible word. This is the powerful and performative word of our God 
The word that endures, as Jesus said to his disciples, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. The word that lasts forever is the word of God that makes you ready. The word that came to you through baptism. The word that was spoken to you. The word through which the Holy Spirit gave you a heart of flesh. Gave you enduring life. So you can hear this call, hear that Jesus is at the door, and know that God has made you ready. In connection to this call to be ready, Jesus gives a parable, a parable of a fig tree. The parable is that when the leaves start to sprout, that you know that summer is near. The leaves have sprouted. You know that Jesus' second coming is near. And he has made you ready. And the second aspect of this that Jesus talks about is in that call to live in your readiness. He uses the second parable that he tells about the doorkeeper to illustrate for you and for me that let us live in that readiness that comes from our God. Jesus tells this story. A master is about to go away on a journey, and he gives various servants of the household tasks to do. And then he focuses in on the doorkeeper. He t tells the doorkeeper, keep watch for when I return. Keep watch for when the master returns. He's to keep watch, to watch out, but in the watching is also working, living in that calling that he has received from the master. And Jesus uses that to direct it to all people. All people are called to be ready, to watch for when the master returns, to live in their readiness. Brothers and sisters, let us apply that call to ourselves. What does it mean to be ready when Jesus returns? Well, there are two aspects I want to point you to. Go to God's word and live in your calling. We've already indicated that God's word is what makes you ready. It strengthens you. So as we see the end approaching, as we have our eyes on the, in the skies looking for when Jesus will come again, let us go time and time and time again to the enduring word of God to be strengthened, to be prepared, to be held near and dear to our God. And as you are strengthened by our God, Live in the task that he has given to you. Serve him. Serve him in keeping watch. It's interesting that once it was said, Martin Luther said to the answer the question, what would you do if the world ended tomorrow? And he answered it by saying he would plant a tree. What does that mean? Why would he plant a tree if the world were to end tomorrow? Well, because this is the Christian life. This is readiness for the end of the world. It is living in that readiness. It is serving God by serving others. So if he knew the end was coming tomorrow, he would continue to do these things that God has tasked him to do. Martin Luther may not have actually said that. There's a lot of 
fake quotes about Martin Luther, but the idea is true and it is biblical. This is the same thought that the Apostle Paul communicated to the church in Thessalonica. In both of his letters, he encouraged them, as you have your eyes on the skies ready for Jesus' second coming, knowing that he could come at any moment, don't be caught in laziness. Don't be caught being idle. But instead, live in your readiness. God has given you these callings, and now do them. Do them in peace, knowing you're not trying to save yourselves. Do them until he comes. Sometimes it has been said that Christians can be so heavenly-minded that they are of no earthly good. This quote actually comes from Oliver Wendell Holmes, Sr., He's the father of a Supreme Court justice in the past. He was also a doctor and a physician. Christians have refuted that thought. Most notably, C.S. Lewis, the famous Christian author, in a book called Mere Christianity. He pushed back on that idea that Christians would be so heavenly-minded that they were no earthly good. Because the result of being truly heavenly-minded, having your eyes on the skies ready for Jesus to come, knowing that Jesus is at the door, is living in service to God. So could we be so heavenly-minded that we are of no earthly good? Well, if you're truly heavenly-minded, you'll be the greatest good to other people because that's what God has called us to do. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is at the door. Are you ready? We know we've been made ready, but there are warnings in Scripture to stand firm. Where it's written, So let him who thinks he stands be careful that he does not fall. How could we fall? I think there are two ditches we could fall into. One is to just totally disregard Jesus' second coming. Don't think about it. Just continue to live in this life with our eyes totally on the earthly things. Not even thinking about the fact that Jesus is at the door. And then be caught unaware when he returns. The other ditch we could fall into is that we could know he's coming. Do the same thing that the Thessalonians were tempted to do and just stop and stare into the sky and say, when are you coming, Jesus? That we fail to see the callings he has given to us. An improper perspective on the end times can lead to many problems. These problems are sin, which would lead to you not being ready for his return, not heeding the call, knowing that he is at the door. But brothers and sisters, you are ready. God has called you to be ready He has called you through the gospel, the gospel of Jesus' first coming, which prepares you for the second coming, that Jesus came to live under God's law for you, the perfect life that you need, a gift he gives to you. And in his first coming, he went to the cross to take the punishment that you deserve, dying on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. Because of Jesus' first coming, you have been made ready for his second coming. So now you hear and you know, Jesus is at the door. Let us be ready 
let us live in that readiness. Knock, knock, knock. Amen.